Shalom and welcome. You're listening to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel. Today is the sixth day of the month of Tammuz, 5775. It is June the 23rd, 2015. And this Shabbat, Parashat Chukat, beginning with Numbers, chapter 19. Here we are, Temple Talk, a project of the International Department of the Temple Institute. I'm Rabbi Chaim Richmond with me in the studio. My best friend and yours, Yitzchak Ruvain. Parshat Chukat. If we if we say that the Book of Numbers is full of the potential of the Jewish people, and as it's been affectionately called by some great rabbis, the Book of Mistakes, because every possible mistake that the nation could have made, they made. And if we say, as we have been saying, that we are basically reading the parallel universe of our own lives, how we are faced with all of these challenges, how we have all of this tension ready, poised to get to go into the land, hopefully, and make the acquisition, which we have yet really to do, even though we're here, we haven't really made the acquisition deeply, fully. So Parsha Chukat is just, I don't know, it's such an incredible uh, experience of so many uh, extremes and so many diametric opposites. It starts out, of course, with the ordinance of the Torah, the red heifer, uh, your favorite subject and ours, the red heifer, the secret, the exclusive antidote to uh, tuma, tumat mate, to a particular type of impurity caused by exposure to death, which of course on a metaphysical level represents a disconnect from the Shekhinah, the source of all life, the divine presence. It's very, very deep. We have this chok, in fact, it's considered to be the chok par excellence, the mother, as it were, of all chukim. A chok is a type of mitzvah, it's a category of Torah commandment, about which we are told in advance that it is above the, the possibility of the realm of human understanding and comprehension. Only person in history who ever understood the ramifications and dynamics of how the commandment of the red heifer works is Moshe himself, and that was because of his extreme nuclear humility and his lack of self, total lack of ego, he was able to understand how the red heifer works. When we say how it works, we basically refer to the conundrum, the, not, not conundrum, the paradox of how the same element, the ashes of the red heifer, will render purity to those who have been impure, but those who perform the ceremony and who are dealing with it, they themselves become impure. Anyway, the point is, uh, the one true obstacle on the on a halachic level, right, on the, on the on the level of Torah law. I'm not talking here about politics, and I'm not talking here about people's misconceptions or philosophy. The real halachic issue that stands in the way of building the temple is only one thing, and that is the process of producing the ashes of the red heifer to cleanse ourselves, to cleanse the place, to cleanse the world, and uh, imagine what would happen if we would be able to do that. And the red heifer has so many dimensions and so much meaning. It's not a miracle, it's not a miracle cow, it's not an angelic cow, it's a regular physical cow, which in itself is a beautiful lesson of what Torah is. It's very real, it's in this world. And um, every year at this time when we study this Torah portion, we get very, very inspired by understanding the many complex uh, spiritual lessons of what the Paraduma, the Red Heifer, is all about. And of course, throughout time, throughout even recent uh, months and years, there has been excitement caused by this or that reporting of this or that particular Red Heifer um, that was born. Uh, uh, the Red Heifer is commonly thought of by many people as being something completely unusual, completely miraculous, completely... Um, uh, unexpected. Um, is that really the case, or are there not many red heifers that may be in the world today that might be possible to use for the temple? You know what? We got a lot to say about this, but we're not going to say it right now. I would uh, add one thing, Rabbi. The proximity between uh, Parshat Chukat, between the ordinance of the red heifer, and uh, in another. 11 days from now, beginning the three weeks uh, of mourning, of introspection, of, of deep thought about the destruction of the Holy Temple, because this gives us a glimpse, you know, into 
into the tikkun, into into how to begin to to, to correct that, and uh, I think it gets us thinking, uh, perhaps in a creative way, in a in a maasi way, in a way of action, uh, which we always stress, uh, sort of as a, uh, uh, an introduction or a prelude uh, or a foreword to the three weeks, and maybe if we bear this in mind, you know, we will see things a little differently uh, rather than simply sitting on the floor and being miserable for three weeks because what a shame we were bad. And you just mentioned seeing and doing, and those are two aspects of the of the rectification of the month of Tammuz, as we mentioned last week. Tammuz is all about seeing the good, seeing the positive, uh, and fixing the 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 uh, the bad sight, as it were, <coughs> the flawed sight of the spies that were walking about the land during this month. And of course, they were walking basically sideways. Like the crab, which is the astrological sign of the month of Tom, was in that beautiful and incredible insight of the Holy Arizal, who mentions this concept of the the sartan, the crab being being the the um, ruling sign, as it were, of the month. How crabs, when they walk, they walk to the side. They would make bad dancers, I guess. Mm. And um, you can walk, you know. A person can be going their whole life, and they cannot be walking straight. They can be they can be sidestepping. Jake walk, as it were. <laughs> Look that one up. Anyway, so um, let's just say that everything in the world that we know about red heifers could very, very drastically change very, very quickly. Um, and that's all we'll say about that for now. Because um, everything in its proper time. But if you believe in miracles, that means that you believe in God. That means that you believe that we are constantly receiving miracles. That means that you believe that everything is a miracle. I assure you that very, very shortly, um, well, that's all I'll say about that for now. Sorry. You'll have to wait. Anyway, we're in the dog days of Tammuz right now. What does that expression, dog days, mean? It's a popular expression in the, in the English language. And I believe it means, if I'm not very much mistaken, uh, the hottest period of the year. And by the way, it's reckoned in antiquity from the heliacal rising of Sirius, the dog star. Hmm. Anyway, um, I think that one of the things that we emphasize in the month of Tammuz is spiritual growth, progress. Um, Forward, and not sideways. Yeah, forward and outside was in spiritual priority. And um, a lot of these things also are, again, um, alluded to in the parasha. Of course, it begins, Parashat Chukat, uh, Numbers 19, begins with the mitzvah, the inexplicable divine commandments. Inexplicable meaning there is an explanation, but God saying, I don't have to tell you. Um, or he's say, him saying, it's beyond you. The, the, the commandment of purity. Well, you need to know. You need to, you need to do it. You don't need to know You're why. You're on a need-to-know basis. Chukat HaTorah, the chok of the Torah, the para aduma, to take the red heifer, the red cow, and to prepare it according to what we read here, and of cor according to all the explanation that we have received ever since Sinai, th through the, the um, continuation of the oral Torah. We read here in this parsha of Miriam's death, and how immediately after she passed away, um, the uh, people had no water because the well that actually physically jumped from place to place, the well of Miriam that accompanied the people throughout their desert war wanderings was in the merit of Miriam. And when she passed away, there's no water. This led to what we read about in chapter 20. Whoa, talk about a game changer. Talk about <laughs> absolute, I don't know what to say. Uh, Moshe and Aaron both decreed against them here. They will not be entering into the land because they gathered the people and instead of speaking to the rock, they Moshe hit the rock. And because of that, uh, Hashem said to Moshe and to Aaron in verse 12, because you did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you will not bring this congregation to the land that I have given them. Oh, wow. I don't think the, 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 the amount of time that we have on a temple talk is 
enough to talk about this even, to understand what, what, what did Moshe have in mind, why did he strike it instead of, instead of speaking it, the myriad things that we've learned about this and what it means, and what it really means, which is that basically that Moshe was not to enter into the land, and uh, that's what made all the difference, because he couldn't enter the land, because it was actually for the benefit of the people of Israel that he didn't enter the land. So this is what happened, and immediately afterwards, um, Moshe, he's not, doesn't seem to be flustered by this, doesn't seem to be uh, uh, wallowing in, in self-pity that he can't go into the land. He's, he's taking care of business. He sent emissaries to, to the king of Edom. Could we go through? Uh, later on, they're attacked by Amalek. Then we have this, if I may say, bizarre episode of these uh, snakes fiery serpents that are sent against the people and they bit the people apparently because of more complaints right why did you bring us up from egypt to die in this wilderness so there's no food and water and our soul is disgusted with this substan insubstantial food <laughs> i mean it's Enough. you know it's, you know you know what i'm thinking like you're, re you're reading about how they're complaining about the manna which is like Hashem's, Hashem is like, as it were, like sitting at a table, slicing his home baked bread, giving it to them. And they're like, like does this, does this pick up? Does this food pick up? Could I have a little, a little a variance here? I, th I think you, for, uh, you missed the uh, death of Aaron. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I? I believe he's before the, s the snakes. Uh, or is he after? I don't think... Uh, you're right about that. No, you are right about that. You're absolutely right about that. Um, Talk that about was right poignant. before chapter 21. Moshe did as Hashem commanded. They ascended Mount, Mount, how do we say it in English? Your call. Uh, Hor Hahar, Hor Hahar. Mount Hor, okay. Um, Take Aaron and Eleazar, his son, and bring them to, up to Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his vestments and dress Eleazar, his son, in, there. in them. Aaron shall be gathered in and die there. Moshe did as Hashem commanded. They ascended Mount Hor before the eyes of the entire assembly. Uh, and when the entire assembly saw that Aaron had perished, they wept for Aaron 30 days, the entire house of Israel. And then Amalek attacked, and then the business with the complaining and the, um, the fiery serpents that came and bit the people. And uh, a large multitude of Israel died, and the people came to Moshe and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against Hashem and against you. Pray to Hashem that he removed from us the serpent. Moshe prayed for the people, and then Mo Hashem said to Moshe, Make for yourself a fiery serpent and place it on a pole, and it will be that anyone who was bitten will look at it and live. And Moshe made a, ser a serpent of copper and placed it on the pole. So it was that if the serpent bit a man, he would steal it, uh, stare at the copper serpent and live. <laughs> Uh, let me just let me just go on here, and then we have this um, beautiful short song, this poem, which is recorded in what's called the Book of Wars of Hashem, right? The gift of the sea of reeds and the rivers of our known, the outpouring of the rivers when it veered to dwell at Ar, leaned against the border of Moab, and then Israel sang a song in verse 17, mm -hmm. first time since. Moshe and the children of Israel right. sang at the, at the sea that now Israel is singing, but Israel is singing on their own. Uh -huh. Moshe is not singing here. They're singing a song, Come up, O well, call out to it, well that the prince is dug. This is all just so amazing. What is it all about? What is it all about? Before we, before we go into that in greater detail, and, and hopefully in this week's Torah portion uh, video lesson, we'll be discussing some of these things. If we don't get to it today, back to the dog days of Tammuz, Yitzchak, mm -hmm. um, and the spiritual priorities of this month, and how we are really trying to grow, to fix, to grow closer to Hashem, because ultimately, in any month of the year, this is the goal, right? I want to be close to Hashem. I want to feel that He's with me all the time. I, I meaning, I'm speaking in the plural. This is what we're trying to do. We want to recognize, to have the merit to recognize that He's always with us, that the main goal and priority of life is to move closer and closer to God all the time. And, and if we feel that all the time, and if we have that in our lives, then automatically we will be the best people that we can be. And I think that's about as... Uh, as clear as it could be, as simple as it could be, what our priorities are. 
You know, I want to do something now that I have rarely done. I want to take a liberty. And I want to, uh, and now don't turn off your set just yet, and don't get angry at me, and don't jump to any conclusions, but let's compare Tammuz to Ramadan. Ramadan is going on right now. It just started, in fact. I think Friday was the first day of Ramadan. So I'm looking up Ramadan. Everybody knows that Ramadan is a month-long Muslim time of fasting and spiritual growth and um, it's uh, we're, we're very conscious of this here in Jerusalem of course and uh, of course on the Temple Mounts uh, because uh, of the violence that seems to erupt uh, but I'm going on to a website now called beliefnet.com and here I read how to make your life more spiritual Ramadan the ninth month in the Islamic calendar is a special time to Muslims as a holy period dedicated to fasting, self-purification, and spiritual attainment. Whether you're a Muslim, Christian, or Jewish, or just a spiritual seeker, you can probably appreciate the goals of Ramadan, colon, a whole body awareness of God and a humble thankfulness for whatever blessings he has granted. Achieving those goals is a challenge for anyone, but after 20 years of fasting, I've learned some valuable lessons to simplify and spiritualize the Ramadan experience and how to keep that special feeling alive throughout the year. Lessons that can help anyone to make their life a little more spiritual and uncomplicated. So check out these tips. Whether you're a Muslim who's been fasting for years or just someone looking for more depth in your spiritual life. Sounds good. It sounds good, but on um, Friday which is basically the first day of um, Ramadan, um, I can't help but mention that a um, Jewish man was murdered by a Muslim terrorist on Sunday. Um, a border policeman was stabbed and grievously injured and now thank God he's doing much better uh, I can't help but noticing that uh, it was reported uh, that in Mecca uh, prayers were said um, for the terrorist who, who stabbed the border policeman immediately after the, the stabbing. And of course, here in Jerusalem at the Damascus Gate that same Friday, leading to the Temple Mount, uh, there were um, protests, thousands of Muslims shouting anti-Israel, slogans bearing images of suicide bombers and Hamas flags. I'm wondering where exactly this fits with the beautiful uh, things that I'm reading on the internet about the spiritual greatness and purity of Ramadan, right? Again, it says here that the goals of Ramadan are very simple. A whole body awareness of God and a humble thankfulness for whatever blessings he has granted. But the way this translates for Muslims is that Jews always have to be killed. No matter, no matter what. And maybe that's part of their whole body awareness of God. And maybe that's their part of their humble thankfulness. So it's beautiful religion of peace. They're wonderful people. And yeah, again, I rarely do this. It's not our mandate. But I think that it's completely true. So we'll stand by it. I, um, I believe after li you and I, Yitzchak, how long have we been living here? Oh, it's getting up now on 34 years. Mm -hmm. Um... It's not the PC thing to do to talk about how Islam is the problem, but it sure is. And what a, what a load of whitewash that this month is about whole body awareness of God. How come we know and how come the, it, the security services of the state of Israel know that when Ramadan comes, you better watch your back. You better be careful because this is the time of murder and mayhem and killing. And as we've seen on, from the very first day, uh, with the murder of a, of a young Jewish man who was uh, who made who who did the sin of hiking, in the in the hills of uh, of his homeland. So uh, yesterday, as on the Temple Mount, 
and we did some successfully. Of course, we have to pray clandestinely, and be, clandestinely, and that gives us an extreme feeling of, of humble thankfulness to Hashem. We're on the Temple Mount, right? And we're standing, our little group, we're standing opposite the Eastern Gate. And on the Temple Mount, opposite us, is one of these horrible women that I alternatively call Valkyries or the Night of the Living Dead Women or whatever. You know, we've shown them on our Facebook page, the black-clad women who are paid by Hamas to incite and tease and ridicule and sometimes even physically attack the Jews who come there. So she's sitting there opposite us, staring at us, and she's uh, chanting. And we're standing there, and, and she's chanting. And somebody that I was with, who was a very, very sweet person that I really, really love, he wrote on his Facebook page in Hebrew that while we were there, like studying Torah, talking Torah, and, and uh, reading our, and, and, and praying quietly to ourselves, this woman was chanting so sweetly and so quietly. And doesn't that show that, wow, it could really be a house of prayer for all people? Other people, in, this is all going on in Hebrew, wrote on his fa Facebook page, Man, you're so naive. I just love you. You're so cute. You're so naive. Because what she was saying in Arabic was, Oh, Allah, slaughter these pigs. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there, you know what? I got nothing else to say. I wanted to well, give that, you... Is that part of the spiritual growth? Is that part of the whole body... Uh, whole body awareness of God and humble thankfulness, whole okay? Body, so this Jews. sweet, sweet boy that I'm with, who doesn't understand Arabic, and neither do I very well, he's standing there, like, and he's like, w he's like moved by the scene, like, wow, she's chanting so sweetly, so quietly, and we're doing our thing. So maybe it could be like a house of prayer for all people, like Isaiah says. The only thing is that first, God's presence has to be understood and recognized, etc. What that verse really means for my house should be called the house of prayer for all people. Anyways, there's Somebody else writes, man, you're so cool, like you don't know what's going on, you're so sweet, but actually we're listening in the, in the video to what she's saying, and she's saying so sweetly and so gently, oh Allah, please slaughter these pigs. Anyway, whatever, happy Ramadan, man, happy Tammuz, and may we merit to really do our tikkun in this month, to see things as they are, you see, and to go straight in front of us, step by step, so that we really can come into the land of Israel and acquire it as God commanded us. Anyway, stay with us. We're not going anywhere. We'll be right back. Temple Talk. Welcome back to Temple Talk. Today, the sixth day of the month of Tammuz, 5775, 23rd day of June 2015. This is Yitzchak Ruven, and with me, Rabbi Chaim Richman. Temple Talk, the real article. Don't be fooled by uh, imposters. Imitators? Don't be fooled by imitators. If you don't hear my voice and the rabbi's voice, it's not Temple Talk. Parshat Chukat, all about the red heifer, all about the, as the rabbi said, you could say he said the dog days, you said the dog days of Tammuz. You could say Chukat is sort of about the dog days of the desert experience because Is it, it the really dog days of Moshe? Hmm? Is it the dog days of Moshe because he, uh, he um, has his ultimate, um, his ultimate letdown, his ultimate failure in his mm -hmm. career? It, uh, the tough days for Moshe, and as you pointed out, he didn't seem to be phased. He immediately went right back to work toward getting his people into the land of Israel. Of course, we'll hear uh, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy that uh, Moshe, in fact, while he was getting it ready, his people to enter the land at the earliest, soonest, earliest date possible, he was, in fact, entreating God uh, uh, constantly. 515 prayers. That's to, the secret of Parshat Vet Hanan. To, uh, to try to get God to, to change his mind, as it were, and allow Moshe. And I want to mention one thing, Rabbi, that you asked me to mention the uh, name of the young Israeli man who was murdered last Friday, uh, Danny Gonen, from the city of Lud, uh, was murdered He's just murdered outside the blessing. town of Talmon. Uh, 
Near to live. May Hashem uh, avenge his blood. Amen. Amen. You, you know, Yitzchak, Moshe, as it were, uh, tripped up in, the, in this parsha. It's like his ultimate failure. But as I've mentioned in the past, it's very intriguing what's what's going on here between the lines, and it's much, much more than we see. And we have to understand there's, there's something very unusual here, <coughs> because in this very same Torah portion, in which we witness Moshe's undoing, as it were, his unraveling, his uh, the decree made against him that he won't be going to the land, doesn't strike you as odd that the par- the parsha begins with the symbol of Moshe's greatness, mm-hmm. that it's that Hashem said, "Speak to the children of Israel, v'yichu elecha." They will take unto you a red heifer, and there is a tradition that the red heifer, ultimately, forever, throughout all the gen- subsequent generations, is always connected to, associated with, and called after Moshe himself. V'yichu elecha paradumat mima. They bring unto you. He has this incredibly. Uh, inimitable and irrevocable, 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 go for it. Connection to the red heifer, and that's because again of his total uh, lack of self. He was he was able to de- to to go to the very depths of understanding of what this incredible process is, because he himself is the symbol of purity himself, and so this uh, the the very same parsha that describes between the lines that is a testimony to that is that is witness to his greatness unparalleled greatness also the very same that very same parsha parsha uh, chukat also uh, features his his ultimate failure however so our sages make it very, very clear, unanimously and universally, Yitzchak, our sages state that Moshe will be coming to this land, that he will be coming into this land in the future. He will bring that very generation into this land. Whoa, whatever that means. And the deeper that we learn about Moshe's relationship to that generation, Moshe, Moshe's relationship to the whole Israel, Moshe's, Moshe's ability to totally sacrifice himself for the greater good, then, then the more that we learn that Moshe, by all means, had to find a way of making sure that he wouldn't come into the land at that time, because it wasn't what Israel needed. Israel needed a new generation. Israel needed the generation of Joshua. And so he threw the game. Hmm? He threw the game. He threw the game. He threw the game. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Very, very deep. Um, yeah, I was talking before about about uh, my 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 anti Ramadan rant. Mm-hmm. You know, we have this this section here about these serpents. And then Hashem said to, Mo- to Moshe, "Take, make one and pu- and put it up on a pole." And he didn't tell him to make one out of out of uh, copper. Right. But Moshe did that on his own because Nachash is the letters of Nachoshet, right. and he knew to make it on copper. He puts it up on a pole. Whoever looks at it is healed. So the sages say, "What is this exactly? Like looking at the serpent, that's what heals." And by the way, this is the source of the commonly depicted pharmacological symbol or is it is it the pharmacy or is it the doctor's office that has a snake around a yeah. pole yeah. this is where it comes from right ancient symbol of healing mm-hmm. we gave it to you first so the sages say and is it indeed the snake that heals is it looking at the snake that heals no it's the it's the sin that causes the punishment and it's returning to hashem that causes the healing so the snake isn't the punishment. It's the sin that the, brings about the punishment. And then looking up at the serpent is really about looking upwards. Looking upwards. The, the, at the serpent happens to be in a context, and that context is God. So then why does it have to be high up if what we really want is for the person to raise their eyes heavenward? I guess because it's a, a stage, it's a stepping stone to understand and reflect 
on what has happened to me, on mm -hmm. what Hashem has set up here, on the process that has come against me. And then I'm looking at the snake and I'm like, well, this didn't work out so well. This didn't go so well for me. But then I'm, uh, my head is up and I'm like, wait, this is all a ruse. This is all, again, a setup, again, a, uh, a way of getting me to wake up out of my lethargy, okay? And I just keep thinking about the parallels between our generation and that generation, and, and uh, I'm, keep, I'm doing a lot of back and forth in this program, a lot of dichotomy. We have the, the dog days of Tammuz and the tikkunim of Tammuz, the spiritual growth, hopefully the potential of Tammuz, opposite the spiritual the growth of the whole body awareness of God and humble thankfulness of Ramadan, which basically means murder any Jew that you can. And by the way... You bite like a snake. Like a snake, thank you. And, and by the way, this is all part of God's incredible system of the realm of holiness set opposite the realm of the Kalipa, which means the husk, the side of darkness, if you would. And it, of course, there's a verse that we're all familiar with in Ecclesiastes that says, et zeh, lu'umat zeh, asa elokim, which means this, opposite that, God created. And that's exactly what's going on here. But I gotta tell you something, I'm thinking about all of this. Tell me. I, I thank you for what you just said, that the snake, the snake, that the fiery snake that's set against us now, okay? And I don't know if Dani Gonein, may Hashem, may Hashem avenge his murder, may his memory be for a blessing. I don't know if this is one of the last things that he saw or not that Friday that he was murdered. But I know, I know that driving through many areas in the land of Israel, where my children live, right on the outskirts and in fact inside Jerusalem, in fact on, on Salah Hadin, on Sheikh Jarrah, on streets in East Jerusalem, I know that I look up and I see a Palestinian flag. The very flag that is synonymous, as far as I'm concerned, with bloodshed and murder and the, and the avowed destruction of Israel that was once illegal, but since Oslo has become darlingized, <laughs> has become romanticized. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? That is the serpent on the pole of our generation for us to look up at and return to Hashem. And I just wanted to share that thought with you. I don't want to say very beautiful. It's very horrifying, but it's, it's certainly very profound. Um, Tammuz, dog days, a month of... Uh, of uh, spiritual growth. Give me some good news and, because uh, we... Lots of good news oh, from the go. Temple Institute. There you go. And why? Because everybody's going to get ready to start mourning, but the truth is the greatest service that we can do to the Holy Temple is not to sit and cry, but to do something about it. And the Temple Institute, we're always doing something. We're, we're hooked on doing. We have uh, many things going on right now. One thing that's going on behind the scenes, but I'm going to share it with you right now, is uh, the Temple Institute is uh, in the process of purchasing uh, from across the Mediterranean uh, uh, the material from the glands of the Chilazon, of the nautical snail. Do you mean the Murex trunculex? Murex. Trunculus. Trunculus snail, which is the snail for producing the tchelet, the blue uh, that we wear on our tzitzit, on our fringes. And of course, it's the same blue that's used to, to produce the, uh, the garments of the high priest, and to produce the avnit, the 32 uh, amot, amot, which is about 16 meter long belt of the ordinary priest. Of the priest ordinary as well. priest, and in fact, in we are purchasing this uh, this tachelit dye for the purpose of making those belts because. Uh, for some time now, the Temple Institute has been producing big day kuna, priestly garments uh, for, what should we say, lay priests as opposed to the high priest. And uh, they, people, uh, priests, uh, kohanim, uh, who uh, can prove their bona fides, that they really are kohanim, are uh, eligible to purchase the garments. Again, we don't sell these garments uh, uh, for teaching purposes or or for a museum purpose, uh, we only sell them to Kohanim who, God willing, will be able to use them themselves uh, in the Holy Temple. And of course, they're only to be worn 
in the Holy Temple. And this is so exciting because, first of all, it's a tremendous expression of faith of the Jewish people that there are people, Kohanim, descendants of Aaron, that are so real, so in touch with their DNA, so in touch with who they are and where they want to go, that they are ordering their own priestly garments. And we might add, as we have taught in the past, the reason this is necessary is because it's not off the rack. It's not one size fits all, and it's not even small, medium, large. The verse states in the book of Exodus, and Hashem says to Moshe regarding Aaron, his brother, that, the, that these clothing shall be lechavod u letiferet, which means for honor and for glory. And our sages understand that those words mean that they have to fit each man perfectly. So people are coming forth. In fact, famous rabbis like Rabbi Shlomo Riskin a number of years ago, mm -hmm. chief rabbi of Ephrat, he actually, he's a Kohen, you know, and he actually ordered his own priestly garments from the Temple Institute. And um, so we are, we are, very excited about that, and we, um, through the miracle of Facebook, we located a wonderful man who was helping us to make a connection in, actually, Milan, Italy, that features a wholesale fish market, and that, uh, that um, f has some experts living there who know how to procure this species, and um, it's the same species that is uh, in use by the organization that um, promotes wearing the original blue thread in the tzitzit. But we need to be able to produce this independently with our own supply because we need this for the priestly garments. And um, so we, are, we have successfully um, made this contact and God willing, in these very days that you'll be hearing this broadcast, um, the supply of, uh, of the Murex trunculix should be making, it, making progress and eventually will be brought to us here in Jerusalem. And when I mentioned about the Kohanim that order their priestly garments as a, ch a sign of great faith, you know, there's so much of that kind of pure uh, enthusiasm and connection to the temple in the heart of, of the Jewish people. There are also, for example, farmers in the land of Israel that are raising um, uh, vineyards. They are producing wine according to the exact biblical specifications for how th the wine that is used for the libations in the Holy Temple have to be made. It's very complicated how, the, how those grapes have to be grown. And there are bottles of this wine uh, for safekeeping at the Temple Institute. And then one of the most beautiful stories of all time, I think, to share with you, and I think we have mentioned it, is that in the Temple Institute, um, in our special uh, room, um, which is actually modeled after the chamber of hewn stone of the Sanhedrin, we have a holy ark. And in the holy ark, there are two Torah scrolls. One is written uh, according to the Ashkenazi tradition, and one is written according to the Sephardic tradition. And these two Torah scrolls were each independently commissioned by two different people and paid for, which is a lot of money to write a Torah scroll because it's like a, a year or even more of work. And it's very, very painstaking. <clears throat> These two Torah scrolls were written by people who said, I want to make sure that there is a Torah to be read in the Holy Temple. And these men parted, these families parted with tens of thousands of dollars each to have a Torah scroll written by a scribe that, they sh that is dedicated only to the Holy Temple. And they brought it to the Temple and they said, would you please hold this here? Just hold it until the Temple is built so that we know that immediately there is a special Torah scroll that was, m that was written for the Holy Temple. This and that is such a tr tremendous inspiration. Harkens back to something we've talked about before, that the actual people say we need, we need uh, um, you know, love uh, um, between, oh. between brothers here in Israel. Baseless love. Baseless? It's uh, not really good. There's a better translation uh, here sometimes. Um, uh, you know, love. Uh, Ahavat that? chinam. Ahavat chinam in, in, in that's Hebrew. not dependent on love. That's not dependent on anything. Uh, between between Jews, in order to be ready to 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 build the holy temple, and we always say, by beginning the process of building the holy temple, we create that that brotherhood between Jews, and we see that because as, just, as the rabbi just mentioned, all these different people never met before, and in different professions, and different living in different places, were all working together. Uh, for the same goal, and it's bringing us together. Uh, I'd like to also mention that uh, the annual, the Temple Institute's annual conference on the Holy Temple will be taking place 
uh, again this year, I believe it's on Rosh Chodesh Av. And the well, it will be the week of Rosh the Chodesh Av. Details will be emerging. Av. It will be um, the 33rd, the 33rd annual conference on temple research. Which always takes place uh, in the old city. Um, and we'll report more on that as, as we are closer to it. Uh, something else extremely exciting. The one, almost one year ago, almost one year ago, I'd say maybe 11 months ago, or maybe even 11 months and a week ago, uh, we began a campaign to raise money uh, for the drafting of architectural plans uh, for the purpose of building. That is, these are not uh, these are actual plans that a, a, um, a contractor could follow to construct it, plans for the sanctuary, for the main building of the Holy Temple. And uh, we are very, very pleased to announce now, and this is our first announcement, that in the following days we'll, we'll be re releasing a very short video that will show some, some of the plans uh, that have been drawn up so far, plus a a very short uh, hadmaya, a very short. It's uh, an animation, animation, an animation of the actual um, structure of the hechal, the sanctuary, and, and as opposed to other animations or um, representations that are around here and there on YouTube or the internet of the temple, this one is completely different because this one is based on the plans that were actually drawn up by the architect that is associated with the Temple Institute who has very novelly and with tremendous erudition and knowledge of Torah and of the arts of draftsmanship. <laughs> he has translated the sources of Torah wisdom and he has transmuted them into the language of architecture and the, and the presentation that we're going to be showing, it's a two minute film, is actually unprecedented in the world. I'll just give you a taste, <coughs> excuse me, of the of the process going on here. And of course, uh, it's not the conclusion of the project. There's still much to be done, and he's still drawing up uh, plans, which, when they are completed, we'll also be be sharing them, uh, uh, sharing that with you. Um, but. Um, there are many elements in, in, involved in the plans that actually, as a rabbi was suggesting, that are very sensitive to, to the uh, descriptions uh, that, we've, that we have from tradition from thousands of years ago to the demands of, of according to what was done in the particular chambers uh, in, the, in the Holy Temple uh, in terms of uh, you know the dimensions in terms there, of there's a lot that's and and that's and un that has never been understood properly because it was you know the difference between studying something and you know just as a text and just as like a course of study and studying it and then trying to implement it physically it's a huge difference so that when you're studying something and you're actually about to execute it you've got to reach conclusions you've got to reach workable conclusions you've got to automatically disqualify things that don't work so it's a it's a tremendous new way of understanding a lot of the requirements which produces uh, new understandings and sometimes very surprising understandings anyway you'll be seeing that very soon so uh, keep your eyes on the Temple Institute's website Facebook page Twitter uh, YouTube channel so you can see it um, and then rabbi there's always the Temple Mount which uh, Again, Jews are going up every day, and new Jews, and more Jews, and and uh, these days of Ramadan, it's, it's and there's it's a lot of crabs around challenge. us when we go up there, and they're all walking sideways, and they really are, yeah. <laughs> and they're trying to prevent us from walking forward. So there you have it, the the Tammuz backslash Ramadan dichotomy, or should I say showdown, played out on the Temple Mount in real life, in real terms. Uh, exactly as as we've been describing. Uh, so you can choose between a what was that? A full-bodied awareness <laughs> of God uh, and a humble thankfulness. You can choose between that, uh, which of course manifests itself with bloody murder, mayhem, and absolute destruction, or you can try to rectify the honor of the God of Israel. I wish that I could say more, but I can't. But Keep your eyes open, your ears open, 
uh, because we really have some very, very important things to share in the almost immediate future, um, and it will be it will be very, very astounding. It will shake your world. It really will. And ours. It really will. So, may we really merit to feel God's presence full-bodied and humble thankfulness, <laughs> uh, walking straight ahead and fixing our sights and fixing everything that we need to fix in this world. May we merit to really get it right. To get it right, this Tammuz, this year, 5775. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you all for being with us on Temple Talk.